welcome to Slash Forward. Today we're going to, once again, mire ourselves in that sweet, sweet early 2000s nostalgia by zipping through a feisty little recap of another underseen but well-funded big studio horror film stacked with a very solid cast. It's the 2001 cruise liner-based action horror supernatural film Ghost Ship, primarily tethered to a massive central scene of destruction that hits the palette just right. We follow a ragtag group of elite ocean salvagers who like to do things in their own way, but always get the job done. Enlisted by aerial photographer Jack Ferryman, they're led to the legendary Antonio Graza, a massive and ornate cruise liner that went missing in 1962 and was presumed lost forever to the unforgiving tides. Turns out, it's just been floating around, seeing what the ocean has to offer and welcoming any passers-by to board her, take a look around, and kindly die, feeding her their souls. So what starts out as a potentially lucrative salvage job turns into an opportunity to develop significant generational wealth, before devolving into a tense struggle just to survive and figure out a way to get back off the ship with souls intact. But what are the odds of accomplishing that without fully understanding the forces acting against them in all its various forms? I'm guessing fairly low, but let's take a look and see. While you're here, feel free to drop a comment to confirm whether or not you like this one. And check out some of my various other offerings. Let's get to it. We open on scenes of magical whimsy aboard a cruise ship from a wayward era. Back when things were classy, no Disney characters or plastic water slides here, just a bunch of well-dressed wasps getting worked up before boning down. We assume the passengers sway rhythmically as a beautiful songstress lilt seductively in an unrecognizable ancient language. But then some trickster ruins the fun by switching a guy wire to Massimo, pulling it taut to the point of snapping and setting off a chain reaction that essentially razor wires everyone in the crowd at once, leaving them standing in momentary awe of the awesome event they've just become a part of before falling to pieces. We then flash forward to present day as some raucous Arctic warriors find themselves in rough waters attempting to save their scavenged shipwreck from the Great Mother Ocean and break in all the rules and best safety practices in the process. But the risk pays off and the dividends are both handsome and public. You may want to get a wallet or a money belt for that. As they prepare to count their stacks, Captain Murphy is approached by Jack Berryman an aerial photographer who's found a choice salvage for them, a ship above water with no apparent occupants that's in international waters, making it ripe for the plucking. Murphy has seen some strange shit going down in the Bering Strait, but when the sea makes an offering, you jump on it. The potential jackpot here, upon discussion, is recognized to be too juicy to pass up, causing these salvage dogs to nearly cream their pants. Murph drives a rock-hard bargain here, but Ferryman ultimately agrees to take a lower percentage, so long as he can go with them, because you can't put a price on lived experience, my friends. Soon they're on their way, with Santos jamming out on the bridge, and Epps giving a pretend haircut to Greer, while Munder and Dodge monkey around like the goofs they are. You know, normal seaman stuff. Murph and Epps try to guide Ferryman through his seasickness, as Santos navigates the shit out of this bitch until he discovers an apparent glitch in his equipment. Dodge pops out on the upper deck and blasts the area ahead with about 3 million candle power, but examining the gear confirms there's something out there that seems to be phasing in and out. They can't raise anyone on the radio, and then the object phases out again, right before phasing back into their faces. This results in a very close call and leaves us wondering if they're really going to be able to tug on that behemoth. Murphy instantly recognizes this as the Antonio Graza. This is civilian tugboat Arctic Warrior. Is there anyone aboard? But if he knows what it is, who does he think he's calling? Also, in the recognition, it is confirmed that under maritime law, this particular ship falls in the finder's keepers category. They climb aboard for a safety and condition check. They venture deep into her belly, and the boys sure do love goofing. Hello. But Murph asks them to kindly shut their effing mouths as he hears a strange noise. They turn a corner to find a still functional clock that, oh, we know what that means. After a good spook, they head off down a hallway where Munder completes the first safety check. In attempting to pull him up, Epps catches sight of that one chick from the opening, but she holds it close to the vest and puts it behind her when they arrive at the bridge. Most of the equipment has seized up over time, so they begin gathering all the documentation to try to piece together what happened. In the process, they discover evidence that they're not the first finders of this ship. When they return to the old tugster, Murphy regales them with a story passed down among the old salts at the tavern about another old abandoned ghost ship that was found after it navigated thousands of miles with no crew. 
When discussing this one, they decide that since she's got no anchors, and they don't want to risk someone else coming around and claiming her bounty, they have little choice but to try to bring her in with just their one boat. Later on, Epps confides in this perfect stranger about what she saw earlier, which he chalks up to the playful musings of an idle mind, something he contends with in his long flights to and fro, which he apparently spends in a hallucinative state. Very reassuring. The next morning, they discover there's a relatively recent hole in the hole, likely from the current pushing her towards some rocky islands off yonder. They intend to patch her up, pump her dry, and then try to set her to drift naturally on the current at an angle that allows them to miss the islands and head into open sea. It's a tough job, but they give themselves three days to complete it. They transfer their equipment over and begin to do their various jobs, each in their own various styles. Murphy silently seeks solitude before entering the captain's quarters. Only captains allowed, it's the law of the sea. Inside, Murphy communes with his fellow Dom and attempts to attune himself to the vibes of the room. He ends up doing this a little too successfully, startling himself with a vision of the good captain. Epps finds the natatorium and notes that the pool is unusually riddled with bullet holes in what must have been one of the most extreme relay races ever sanctioned. She has another close encounter and bangs her head on the floor. Dodge and Munder find the engine room, but it's totally flooded. They try to raise Epps on the radio, but she's busy feeding the ship and is found here by ferrymen. They examine the pool, but as they leave, they miss that it seems to be filling itself with blood and bodies. Rear is off doing his own thing and hears the faint sound of singing in the distance, which is also picked up on the radios. Everyone's spook levels are rising, but they continue on regardless. Epps is momentarily waylaid when she goes fiddling around in the laundry room and finds a cache of waterlogged corpses. In their eagerness to be free of this cursed sight, the ship easily guides them where it wants them to go. Greer arrives at the place where the singing likely originated and finds a recently lit cigarette which he presumes to be Epps's. He walks on and misses that Francesca is waiting in the wings. Despite all they seem, Jack is tickled by the sight of some rusty old cars. An unusual movement under the mailbags attracts their attention, but it's just rats finding a niche in this new ecosystem. Right underneath them, though, is some gold. They try to raise the others on the radio when a ghostly voice calls out to them. Epps eventually walks into the walk-in, even though that's clearly not the way out. She finds it to be filled with her standard rows of half cows hanging from the hooks. Oh, and also Munder and Dodge are in there dicking around. And it's a good thing she checked it because they have been waiting 45 minutes for someone to happen by. Unfortunately for them, she's in no mood for joking due to the abundance of dead bodies and gold. But when they focus on the gold part, it's really easy to forget that other stuff. With this unmarked bullion, the mass grave of fairly recent corpses, and Greer's report of a spectral seductress, they're thinking ghost ship. Except for real this time. Given the relatively low market value of ghosts, they narrow down the application of finders keepers and opt to quickly grab the gold and leave behind the ship. And honestly, they should just leave the equipment as well. You're filthy rich. But their delay allows the invisible hand of death to gas up the engine bay. Ghost Girl tries to warn them but gets speared by another ghost. But anyway, she's on a different ship, so Greer doesn't hear her. He fires her up and they straight up explode. Epps dives in to try to pull the boat to the surface. She can't, so she settles on saving Greer instead. Now, they're stuck on an abandoned ship and fairly upset about it for a variety of different reasons. Epps steps up and suggests they try to get the boat drifting as they had originally planned, floating until help comes. Greer thinks they should build a raft, but that's dumb. He's a dumb guy. This realization, plus the head trauma, puts him in a fairly crabby mood. Later on, Epps scours the ship's manifest and presumes Katie to be her girl. Now armed with the name, she goes off, calling out in the dark. Eventually, the boat again shows her the way. She explores the cozy little space, whimsically decorated with a variety of drawings plastered on the wall, which were a design choice to distract from the desiccated corpse. Meanwhile, Munder and Dodge raid the kitchen and try to decide if canned goods can keep for 40 years. As it turns out, these beans are straight fire, and the boys tuck in until their bellies are swollen with ancient rations. They become distracted fantasizing about what they'll buy each other with their shares of the money, as if they aren't both hundred millionaires capable of buying their own stuff. Then comes the late discovery that they should have scraped below the surface of the spotted dick, because that shit has turned. Elsewhere, Greer goes back to drown his sorrows in that sweet, sweet voice. But when he gets to the ballroom, he suddenly finds himself transported into a green screen of ghostly happenings that he must react to in order to sell the effect. When the restoration is complete, he receives a standing O, even though he didn't do anything. He's confronted with a conundrum and thinks of his girl, but also realizes that you can't cheat if the cheating is happening inside your own mind. That's some high-level rationalizing right there. He decides to take it to the next level and finds that Francesca is totally game. And since Greer is serious about fantasy sex, he begins stripping down.
town to go in on his fantasy girl. Unfortunately, he fails to find purchase, phasing through her so that it is he who takes the shaft. Back in the captain's lounge, Murph is having drinks with El Capitano himself. Captain to captain, it's revealed to Murphy that the Graza actually saved that other ghost ship he had mentioned earlier. They had transported between ships the trunks of gold and a single survivor. We don't see who it is, but for Murphy, it's as though he's seen a ghost. Another one, and he tries to go gather up his crew. Unfortunately, he is confronted by the bitter specter of Santos, now stuck on this infernal ship of lost souls. We then find that Epps was able to meet up with Katie, and discovers that she's super sad she was turned into a ghost before she got a chance to make it to port and meet up with her parents. Also, that she can only interact with the material world via her feet. Yes, fully. Epps learns there are spirits trapped here due to an evil entity trying to fulfill his quota of souls. But her excessive revelation warrants a spiritual punishment, whatever that may be. After running off, Epps finds Murph, but Santos plays a similar mind game to what we saw previously, tricking Murphy into trying to kill Epps. Ferryman steps in just in time to fend off the attack. Assuming that alcohol played a role here, they let him sleep it off inside a glass capsule. The survivors do manage to link up, and everyone is fully informed of the situation involving supernatural entities on board. But they still have to fix her up in order to save themselves, so they get to it and begin welding their brains out and pumping her dry to facilitate staying afloat until rescued in about 45 years or so. Epps goes off to find Greer and is led to him by Katie. Meanwhile, the number two pump gets clogged and Munder is selected to go massage it loose. Katie decides to merge minds with Epps and takes her back to that fateful night where we see that the kitchen staff was putting way more rat poison than you'd want into the stuffed mushrooms and prosciutto wrapped asparagus. All over the rest of the ship, everyone was getting bisected and sliced up and what have you. The goal was to slaughter the lot of them. Francesca had decided to rise and grind that day, boss pitching her way into convincing this thirsty grunt to gun down his compadres before taking him out. Turns out, she had really been with Slick Willie over here, or so she had originally thought. As it is revealed, that man was Jack Ferryman, the King Ghost. Recognizing that something must be up, she rushes back to the captain, only to find that he's been preserved for future generations. She then goes to the bridge to warn Dodge right as Jack comes wandering in. Epps plays it cool, for now and tells them to stick together while she goes to get Munder. Except he had been scuba diving his way toward trouble, and found himself inadvertently swimming into the gear works of the giant ship. The harsh, unfeeling machinery eats him up until there is almost nothing left, but thankfully does it in a way that Epps knows so she doesn't waste any time. Back on the bridge, Jack decides that it's time to reveal his true self, by insulting Dodge's masculinity. In response, Dodge blasts his ass wide open, which only provides a momentary hindrance to his advance, we see. When Dodge catches up with Epps, she's setting charges so she can sink this cursed boat. Still hungry for riches, he tries to convince her that they should at least attempt to salvage the gold, and then possibly live their lives together. Once rejected, his nice guy mentality emerges, but only because he's actually Jack. He tries to explain that he just needs someone to fix his lovely cruise liner and then kindly die, so he can keep floating on the open seas and please his master with a fine collection of souls, demonstrating that hell is full of productivity slaves. Instead, after a brief struggle, she dedicates her life to ensuring the exact opposite of that. Luckily, she happens to be very durable against concussive blasts, and is guided through the wreckage by Katie. She then drifts upward with all the other lost souls, ascending toward heaven per the ghost collection bylaws. Epps pops up above the surface and basks in the awe and glory of the ghost ship. She then floats on her trunk until picked up by the next passing vessel, which takes her to port for treatment of her extreme sunburn. In her weakened state, she's forced to watch passively as they load the cruise liner with some familiar crates of gold. And then… What? Well, I'm not totally sure what we were supposed to think about that. I can see this movie holding a lasting impression for folks who saw it when it came out and were of a particular age, because it is very much a product of its time. In that way, it's very similar in overall feel to 13 Ghosts. It has some interesting ideas, and I'm sure many viewers have held on to fond memories of the dance floor scene, but it really seems like a movie that's there just to lead you through a sequence of scenes. I think they knew what they wanted to do, and the split groups going through different events simultaneously Simultaneously was put together competently enough that you never felt lost about what was happening. Despite that, there's no clear establishment of the rules around Jack's powers or any sort of cohesion between his motivations and how things played out in real life. He wanted the ship to keep floating to collect souls, but how often was the ship visited? Doesn't seem like there was much activity after that first bloodbath. 
And Jack's not attached to the ship. He came to the mainland to hire them, and then again to board another ship. Why not just abandon the Graza and find another fully loaded ship? And then there was a goal. What was that about? He has to place many bars of gold on a ship in order to take the souls thereon? This is a movie that's just like trying to have a good time, man. And it finds it impolite when you ask too many questions. Before we go, I'd like to give a huge thanks to my donors, memorialized in the Hall of Headshots. <laughs> I have a website set up where you can support the channel through donations or merch. Any donation unlocks a growing collection of uncensored movie recaps. And if you enjoyed the video, I would love for you to become a part of the channel by subscribing. Thanks for watching.